I figured out before the VA figured out that I have Eagle Syndrome. When I went to the VA, they weren't concerned with what I was showing them. And I just kept fighting them for a while until I finally got some traction and got an ENT appointment. But what happened was the ENT appointment was so far out, like four months in the future, that it didn't fly with me. And so because it was so far out in the future, the VA Choice allows me to get an outside in the area ENT. I was able to find a online support group called Living with Eagles, which allowed me to find a doctor list. I found that there was one that happened to be in the VA network here in Las Vegas. After he looked at my scans and got his 3D reconstruction, he decided to call me up and say that, you know, Shane, this is the worst Eagle syndrome I've ever seen, and I won't be able to treat you. My name is Ryan Osborne. I trained as a head and neck surgeon in South Central Los Angeles managing the most complex cancer and trauma patients in the country. I've operated across the globe in first and third world countries. My experiences have taught me the value of flexible and innovative thinking, but I realized that our healthcare system doesn't always allow for that. So I started Osborne Head and Neck Institute. I made it my mission to find the best, most creative surgeons around, and I gave them the space to excel. Together, we create a new standard in medicine. These are our stories. There's also a promise America makes to its troops, and that is, if you serve your country, when you come home, your country will serve you. Fox 13 investigates troubling claims from local veterans. They say they are still, still after all these years, facing excessive wait times for benefits and health care. CBS News investigations revealed widespread manipulation of appointment wait times. The government ordered a review of every hospital after reports that patients were dying while waiting and waiting and waiting for care. On Monday, the department released an audit of VA hospitals and clinics across the country. It shows 57,000 military veterans have been waiting more than three months to see a doctor, and another 64,000 appear to have fallen through the cracks. As well. They're from a Veterans Affairs Hospital waiting room in Durham, North Carolina. A Marine vet's wife took the pics, which of course, as you can see, show a vet slumped over in a chair, one other vet's lying down on the floor. They claim they saw a handful of older veterans uh, ignored by hospital personnel during the seven hours that they were there. And we're fighting to make sure that you get the care that you so richly earned. And today's legislation is one more promise that the Trump administration is keeping. And we've done a lot of promises and we've kept them all. I'm Shane Figueroa, I'm 29 years old. I'm a US Navy veteran. And I'm from here, Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm not trying to disrespect any doctors that work in the VA. I know I've had a lot of great doctors in the VA and I've had a lot of bad doctors in the VA. Some of them don't want to really listen, but there are a lot of them that will take an hour just to treat one patient. There are the doctors that I see in the ER just want to get me out of there as fast as possible. I mean, I know that that's kind of the name of the game, but when they see that there's this in my neck, they don't recommend further treatment. They don't recommend further scans. They just kind of like throw their arms up in the air and go, you know, well, there's something there. Months go by with the VA, I'm still bugging them, asking you know, what's going on, what's going on. And it turns out that the person who's supposed to be finding me a surgery is kind of gave up trying to find me a surgery and didn't tell anybody. And so I found out that the last thing he said was, I can't think of anyone in the VA network that can perform the surgery. And so at that point, I was feeling kind of lost and hopeless. And I was like, I'm just gonna write Sue from OH&I, just kind of lay out Nah, everything that was going on. 
Sue, thank you for the reply. You are actually 10 times faster at replying than the VA. While Dr. Osborne doesn't think the risk is worth it, I definitely do. Because of my Eagle syndrome, my wife and I can't be intimate. Every time we try, my pain flares up worse. I can't even study for my classes. I'm in such pain all the time that I would rather die than live like this any longer. Every day having to wake up and like, okay, I'm just going to be spending my day practically doing nothing and feeling like a burden and a disappointment to everyone around me. So why should I be a burden to them? Why should I keep going this way? Every day is a personal hell. <laughs> I haven't read this in a long time. At that point, every day, <clears throat> I'd have thoughts of suicide where I just couldn't handle the pain. Because it took a long time for the, <clears throat> for the VA to even give me pain medications throughout the day. Existence is not a life Every day I hope that it's either my last or that I will finally get this surgery. I told her about all of this and she rushed it over to uh, Dr. Osborne who um, graciously gave me another phone interview who then um, at the end of it decided to uh, give me the surgery and, and, and pay for it, which it blew me away. I mean, I'm on the verge of crying right now just thinking about it. And I did cry at the time. <sighs> so that's, that's what brought me to OHI. I have a son who's almost Shane's age, and it just really hit home. So I thought, well, why not give it a try? I know Dr. Osborne's an expert in this. And I thought, well, if anybody can help this guy, um, it would be our team here. So Eagle Syndrome, to put it very simply, there are two ligaments that you have one on each side of your neck and these ligaments attach to the skull and they attach to what we call the hyoid bone which is sort of like the wishbone of a human being. And sometimes those ligaments, which are generally soft and, and mobile, just like a ligament on, that you would find on a chicken leg, it turns hard and calcified like bone. So it becomes like these rigid rods that are stuck in your neck. And those rigid rods, because of where they're located next to multiple cranial nerves, one that moves your tongue, one that moves your face, also arteries and veins such as the jugular vein and the carotid artery when there's compression on those structures people can get a host of different symptoms that's your facial nerve this is your carotid artery and that's your jugular vein that's taking blood to your brain that's taking blood away from your brain this is that ligament there's a nerve so you see why no one wants to go on that area mm -hmm. um, because it, it's it's close to everything that's important it's in an area where you can hurt the patient as quickly as you could help them. You have major nerves, major arteries and veins all tucked in that little bitty space. And you, you're really working within about a one inch, square inch radius. If you make the wrong move in one direction or another, you are going to hurt that patient. I, I take any risk, honestly, at this point. I know that a doctor wouldn't take risks that, you know, if there was a 90% chance that I'd die, they wouldn't take the risk of doing it. But at this point in my life, I would. Without, without a second doubt. And I can't think of a better doctor than Dr. Osborne. I mean, I've done my research and I, I've seen everything that he can do. And if anyone's gonna, if I'm gonna take this risk with anyone, I'd want it to be with him. I just want, I want to get my life back. Shane, we're ready for you. Okay,
going into this surgery, although he has the calcifications on both the left and the right side, it would be very risky to operate on both ligaments at the same time. So we're going to do the side that we believe to be causing him the most difficulty. If after that he recovers and he gets enough improvement, that may be the only surgery we do. If it's not, we're going to go back and do the other side. We have to find the, the facial nerve, we have to find the jugular vein and the carotid artery, as well as the hypoglossal nerve. Once we've identified those structures, we can move those out of the way and move towards actually cutting out the calcified ligament. So the surgery went well, it's over. And I was able to remove the entire ligament that was calcified. As far as how this is going to work for Shane, we're gonna to have to wait and see. I still don't know if I've helped him. All right, round one, successfully done. There are 18.2 million veterans in the United States. More than 9 million of them are called to serve each year. As these veterans risk their lives to serve our country, it is up to us to take care of them when they return home. However, sometimes this is not the case. Many of our veterans return home finding the transition to civilian life to be rather difficult. Some of the problems they face are psychological trauma, lack of affordable housing, and lack of adequate employment. This ultimately leads to depression. There are an average of 20 veterans who commit suicide every day. Many veterans, just like Shane, face staggering waiting times just to get an appointment at the VA. These veterans return home with unique and special ailments. For those of us in the private sector of medicine, we have an opportunity no, no, wait a minute. We have an obligation to care for these men and women who have risked their lives to serve our country. I noticed a great deal of freedom in my life. I didn't feel like I was caged in my own home. I was caged in my own body where I had all these desires to go out and do things, but every time I would, I would have some sort of physical ailment that would always be holding me back. I was always depressed about that. I was always sad. It, you know, it's kind of funny. It, was, it took me a while to think of the word depressed because I was. I was overly depressed 
24-7, and now I don't even think about the word depression. It's, it's kind of a little bit more foreign to me. I'm happier, I'm jovial. There's been such a long time coming of me trying to find a way for me to be happy, and you know, I didn't realize how much that was tied to my physical ailments. You know, I've been able to get back into doing the passions that I love, like Taekwondo and martial arts. It's a nice feeling to be able to make it through and know that I'm, I'm keeping up with everybody that I should be able to keep up with. I feel like an older version of myself, a happier version of myself that I haven't seen in a long, long time. There's two types of healing with surgery. There's the physical um, healing from the incision and potentially everyone's worried about having a scar. But there's also the emotional healing of knowing that this big weight has been lifted off your shoulders and that you can move forward. You know what was wrong with your body. It's been addressed and now you can put that behind you. So in that sense, I think Shane's going to be really happy. And he's going to live a great life. There's a need for qualified physicians, and there are a lot of veterans that are left in the dust. 40 veterans died at this VA hospital while waiting up to 21 months to see a doctor. All they have to rely on is the check that they get from the VA disability, and all they have to rely on is their VA insurance. And their VA doctor is basically telling them, I can't serve you. I mean, for me, they literally didn't have a surgeon at all that could perform the surgery that I needed. No veteran is the same. They all have very different medical problems, and I feel like the VA is giving them a general, you know, one-size-fits-all Band-Aid. Veteran and Purple Heart winner Ralph DeCastro died after waiting months for a specialist visit to diagnose the lump found on his neck after a routine checkup. We need more specialized services. We need more opportunities to go out into town and seek out um, more specialized care. Dr. Osborne wasn't the first ENT specialist that worked on Eagle Syndrome that I'd try and come in contact with, but they were the first ones to treat me as an actual individual. They were the first ones to not treat me as just another symptom to get fixed. When I came at Sue with this pain and this despair and agony that I came at her, she came at me with just complete open arms and like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I can to help you. It's not just me, you know, along the way there's so many people here that facilitate every, every part of the patient experience, you know. It, it was just my day to get that call. It was like, at that moment, God, you know, decided to answer my prayers and put Sue in front of me. I mean, she was the, the call to my, to my prayer, and I'm so thankful. You never know what you're gonna come across, who you're gonna come across, and to have the opportunity to have that kind of impact on a patient's life is really amazing. I love you, Sue. <laughs> Dr. Osborne, you've been an angel in my life, and you've taken my life from where I was living in hell, and now I feel like I'm, you know, at least able to stand on the earth and pursue getting into heaven, if that makes sense in a, in a way. I, I feel a bit redeemed physically, and it wouldn't have happened if not for Dr. Osborne. I'll owe him for the rest of my life. I don't, I don't know what I'll be able to do to repay him for everything that he's done for me and my family. Seeing Shane now after surgery and watching him do all the things he couldn't do before and just seeing his persona change, I see that surgery was not done in vain, and I'm glad that I was able to help him in that situation. You know, it's, um, it's scary being the patient, but sometimes it's equally scary being the surgeon. I want to help, I don't want to hurt, but when you're in this gray zone and you don't know which one is going to be the situation, it's hard sometimes to pull the trigger, but I'm glad we did.